Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. Today we're going to talk about cryptocurrency news and we're going to ask the question, can crypto help Venezuela? I was wrong. I recently watched, recently meaning yesterday, uh, yesterday I watched a or listened to a podcast and the author of the podcast made a trip down to Venezuela and the guy who did the podcast is a crypto uh, advocate. He's a Bitcoin advocate and he talks about in the podcast how he had always felt and had advocated how Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was a great solution to people in Venezuela and they have a hair on fire problem because they're dealing with hyperinflation. You know, when you work uh, when you work all week long and get paid at the end of the week, the money you made at the end of the week for what you agreed on for the work you did is actually worth less than when you agreed and actually performed the work. You know, in some cases, they've experienced as much as 10% inflation in a single month. And so if you were able to buy 10 loaves of bread for, the, for, for whatever amount of money, all of a sudden, that same amount of money can only buy 9 loaves of bread, and it got worse and worse and worse over the last number of years. But as we talk about Venezuela today, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that it was only a couple of decades ago, it was about two decades or more, Venezuela used to be the richest country in Latin America. In South America, Venezuelans enjoyed more prosperity and were wealthier than the rest of the, uh, South America. And their neighboring countries used to send their families to go work in Venezuela so that they could make money and send it back home. In fact, Colombia is one of those. And what we're going to do is I'm going to play a short segment from this podcast. It's part of the podcast that really touched me a lot. Um, I want you to hear about it as he's talking about how crypto can help Venezuela. While he was down in Venezuela, he ran into a couple, and I want you to hear him telling the story of this couple. And then finally, after we talk about that, we're going to kind of look at with with the, the virus and the pandemic that everybody is facing, could the United States face starvation? Currently, today, the United States is the wealthiest nation in the world. But is that on the verge of changing? We want to dig into it deeper. So today is more of a somber podcast. Normally I'm very upbeat. I'm a very bullish person. I think cryptocurrency is going to the moon. But I think we need to take a look at some serious subjects, especially after I listen to this podcast about Venezuela. And so today is going to be a little bit more serious of a, of a video. Um, my video is on the more serious nature today. Um, and so one thing is I, I want to leave you before we get into it. I was just listening to a song by Bob Marley called Don't Worry, Be Happy. And we're, we're, we're beginning to get in ta into times where things may get more and more stressful as we go. And I think that's a really good sentiment for us to try and keep in mind because as things get more difficult, it's common, it's, it's just natural to be consumed with worry. And being consumed with worry doesn't help, it doesn't make things better. In fact, in some cases, being consumed with worry actually makes your circumstances more difficult. So that sentiment, don't worry, be happy, is not about being irresponsible. It's about dealing with tough times with a strong, uh, positive outlook. And sometimes hanging on to that strong, positive outlook may be all you got, but it's better than getting overwhelmed with worry and anxiety, which in the long run does you no good and does your family no good. So my sentiment throughout this video is going to be don't worry, be happy, uh, look for the good things, even if they're just small good things. Try and find the good things in every day. So let's get right into it. My video channel is Cryptocurrency Trading for Beginners, Ideas to Help You Take Profits and Avoid Losses. 
Can we get this video to 99 likes? Help us out, smash that like button. It makes a huge difference with Google and with YouTube and with the algorithms and with growing the channel. So please smash the like button. It really makes a big difference. So I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. So let's talk about it. This is the bot podcast that I was making uh, mention to just a minute ago. We're going to skip forward to 28 minutes into it, and the total podcast is an hour and 40 minutes. Now, in the description below, I'm going to give you a link so that you can get out and listen to this entire podcast. If you're interested, I strongly recommend that you listen to it in its entirety. It's, it was very, very eye-opening for me and really helped me understand a lot more about what cryptocurrency can do and what cryptocurrency cannot do. Um, now, at, at, since we're already 28 minutes into the podcast, let me kind of get you up to speed to where we're at and what we're about to hear. Um, so Peter McCormick traveled down to a border town in Venezuela right in Colombia. And in Colombia, it used to be that people from Colombia would travel down to Venezuela because Venezuela used to be the richest country in Latin America, in South America. They were the wealthiest. And, and people in Colombia were poor, and so they went to Venezuela so that they could find work, make money, and send the money back home to their families. Well, now things have switched. Venezuela is poorer than Colombia, and so people from Venezuela are pouring across the borders into Colombia trying to find work so that they can take money back home to their families in Venezuela. Now, it's on the verge of collapsing. In other words, Colombia did that out of the kindness of their heart because for so many decades, their families used to go to uh, Venezuela, and so the Colombians have allowed Venezuela to come up to their country, but they're starting to, to buckle under the pressure of all of these Venezuelans trying to work in Colombia, and it's causing such a hardship on Colombia that they are considering shutting their borders to the Venezuelans, which unfortunately would make things much worse in Venezuela. So uh, Peter was going around to some of the areas where they're actually feeding people, and he ran into this one couple, and now he's about to tell that couple's story. When we went in, there was nobody in there. It was, it was empty. Apart from one guy who was there with his, turns out his wife and his baby. And we were setting up our camera equipment because we were going to interview the director of the NGO, and he was waving me over and then started talking to me in Spanish. And I don't speak Spanish, so my cameraman translated. But he said, are you doing interviews? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, can you interview me? And I, I didn't understand what he was saying, but he was crying as he said it. And he, he was saying, people have to know what's going on in Venezuela. I want to tell the story. So I said, yeah, fine, fine, of course, no problem. So this, this guy, he, he's got four children. Three are living in Venezuela with his um, parents. Um, but his newborn baby and his wife were with him, and they made the decision, because there was no work where they were in Venezuela, they made the decision to come to Kukata for him to find work. And, and send money. The, send money back, send food back, you know, send whatever, just send, you know, they kept saying rice, but you know, whatever to send back, because the mother and father can't work. And he'd been there a week and couldn't find any work. So he was really desperate. They were living on the street, so, so this is a, you know, they're in their 20s, they've got a baby that's less than a year old, say nine months old, and they're, they're sleeping on the street. That, this, is, this is why I get really fucking annoyed with these arseholes on Twitter who come and start arguing that you're a liar, you're spreading propaganda, you know, you, you, you didn't really see uh, Venezuela, you, you're just trying to support an American coup, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, I, I saw a guy in tears who was explaining to me that him and his wife and his newborn, well, new, not newborn, but uh, I'd say this baby was six to nine months old, are living on the street, and he said, every night you sleep with one eye open because people will try and steal your clothes from you at night. And he was crying, telling this story. It was very, very emotional. It affected me quite a lot. And then after the interview was done, um, this is the bit I've told people, I was like, I've got to give this guy some money, right? And it's one of these things that I guess the, the more you do this, you probably, it becomes a habit you might do less, but you can't help but just want to give him some money. 
So I had, I had like 100 bucks in my pocket. I was like, I'll give him 60 bucks, right? So anyway, at the end of the interview, I checked. I said, is it okay to give him money? And I said, yeah. And I, I gave him 60 bucks. And he, he collapsed in my arms, like just like, wrapped them around me. And I've never had somebody hold me so tight. And his eyes were streaming. And where it's like 60 bucks, I mean... Yeah, what, what does that buy you? So it doesn't even buy you a pair of trainers, right? And if you needed some new trainers, Stefan, today, you just go and buy them. You wouldn't think right, yeah. Them. I mean, you think you wouldn't think that hard about it, right? So yeah, you've probably had a steak once that's cost 60, sixty bucks, right? Not even thought about it. And it turns out, I said to the guys, like, look, I know that's a lot of money, but like, what's the reality of that? He said, well, his family, his whole family, can now eat for three months. He can go home. He'll be with his kids, and you know, they're good for three months, which. Which is, kind of, whilst it's kind of obvious, to actually go through that process of, you know, 60 bucks is nothing to you or I, but to see how that changed someone's life and to see the, almost the worry drain from his face, that really affected me. Yeah, and I think, so yeah, because in your mind as well at that time, you're thinking, well, I want to help people, but I can't help them all, right? Yeah, there was no way I was going to suddenly go to the bank and then distribute money to everyone for a cup. I mean, I, I gave you know, a few bits of money away here or there, but I, you would just be hounded and potentially put yourself in a dangerous situation. You know, we were in a private situation and, then, you know, he had a baby with him. Another thing that struck me is that they, every now and again, there were kids running in and out. They were letting them in like one or two at a time. And what was happening, the kids were coming in and they were coming to the taps to drink water and then leaving. And, and also washing themselves, but even getting water is quite difficult there. And so they were just constantly, the, the kids knew they could come to this place and they could drink water. And then I, I also then, the, my fixer, he also, so this is also when I did my first experience with Bitcoin. So there were two things. And I'm trying to be as objective as possible about Bitcoin and the opportunity in Venezuela. I almost don't want to look at it, say, the opportunity for Bitcoin, because I don't want to be opportunists about being opportunists about Bitcoin. Yeah. I want to almost come at the angle as how can we help them? If Bitcoin can help, great. But rather than look at it as an opportunity for Bitcoin, do you see? Do you understand the, the right? The I mean, it's it's more just like Bitcoin will just get adopted naturally. It's not like it needs anyone to go out there and shill it and say, yeah, use this. It's just yeah, and it's yeah. More in the general case of what can be done, as opposed to like, oh, let me shill my Bitcoin to you guys. Yeah, and perhaps if I didn't have Defiance, I would have gone there and looked for the opportunity of Bitcoin. But now I have Defiance, I wanted to go and see what the story is, what the truth is, and, and relay that back. So these were my first two experiences of Bitcoin. Firstly, they had a donation poster on the wall. And all that said to me is, we need money to run. We rely on donations. We will take your Bitcoin. But I almost certainly would say they would take your Dentacoin. All they're going to do is they're going to convert whatever you send them into dollars so they can buy food and the necessities and pay people to actually, well, I don't know if they're volunteers or paid, but to actually run the center. That's the entire entire role of Bitcoin there. It's a way to get money to them easily. Probably easier than via the banks. That said, my fixers um, didn't want paying in Bitcoin. They wanted they wanted paying in cash or PayPal, which they can, they can do both. They neither wanted Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin for me in that instance, it was just the, the all it is is please give us Bitcoin because we want to we want to get dollars. So the second thing was the, the my fixer was running a he's a Bitcoiner. He was running a session to teach people about Bitcoin. So after we did the interview with the director, about 30 people came in and sat down and they had a lesson about a, a Bitcoin lesson. And what was really interesting about that is like, again, I have to be as objective as possible. You know, it's 30 people sat there that that all very poor, you know, extremely, you know, this is extreme poverty. And they're sat there having a lesson about Bitcoin, being taught about that, you know, various things like your your own bank, this is how you manage your private keys, etc. And I was watching them, and it, I think it would be very different from a Stefan Levera course, where you would have a bunch of people sat there, attentive, keeping notes, you know, willing to engage and learn. I think these people have got two things. They've got time on their side. You know, their, their day is filled with, is about survival, earning money, finding food. But there are a lot of people just sitting around doing nothing. Like a lot of people just sitting around doing nothing. So they've got time on their side to fill it. And also, somebody saying, this is, 
this is something to do with money. <laughs> this is a, a way you can get money in and out of, uh, of, of Venezuela. But these people were not hugely engaged as a group. Some were, but I didn't imagine they're all going to leave and go, oh, wow, this is amazing, a new decentralized form of money that can take down the central banks, and I can, you know, I can become self-sovereign. I better start stacking sacks. That is, <laughs> of course not. The, and they're not in the role, they're not in the position for that. It would be more, no. as I see it, more like maybe on the margin, some people might use it to move some money around, and that's, that's kind of it for now in that scenario. Yeah, it, it, I think he was. I think the main lesson was: look, this is remittance. If you need it, if you need to send some money back into Venezuela, because a lot of people don't have bank accounts now, they can't get bank accounts. Um, so, you know, if you're taking money across to a board from the, the other side of Cucuta, the, the border town, the other side, fine, you can just transport dollars. But say if your family's in Caracas and it's far away, you, if you want, you, you could buy some Bitcoin, send it to them, you know, and and you can do it without a bank account. That is certainly a use case, and it does certainly exist. But that, but there are some realities that really stood out. So, firstly, what was explained to me is that some of these people are sharing phones. Okay, mm. so if you're sharing a phone, that's not an ideal scenario for holding Bitcoin, right? Even if they have a phone of their own, almost none of them have data services, so they rely on being able to connect to some kind of Wi-Fi, and also they don't always have access to power to charge their phone, and that is a reality. So I. So we'll stop there. Uh, again, this goes on for about an hour and 40 minutes, and I strongly recommend checking it out. I learned a huge amount. The link for this video will be in our YouTube comments below. And so if you decide you want to check it out, just click, click the link to get to the YouTube uh, uh, channel for this, the YouTube website for my video. And then down below will be a link to this video, this podcast, so you can get the rest of it. A couple of other things that I wanted to talk about. This article came out about four weeks ago. Uh, today is March 26, 2020. And uh, this talks about how one in three Venezuela, uh, Venezuelans are not getting enough to eat, according to the United Nations. One of every three people in Venezuela is struggling to put enough food on the table to meet minimum nutrition requirements as the nation's severe economic contraction and political upheaval persists, according to a new study by the UN World Food Programme. A nationwide survey based on data from 8,375 questionnaires reveals a startling picture of the large number of Venezuelans surviving off a diet consisting largely of tubers and beans as hyperinflation re renders many salaries worthless. A total of 9.3 million, roughly a third of the population, are moderately or severely food insecure, said the study, which was conducted at the invitation of the Venezuelan government. Food insecurity is defined as an individual being unable to meet basic dietary needs. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that when people are starving, Bitcoin doesn't really help them out. As he pointed out in his podcast, <clears throat> people are having to share phones because they can't afford a phone for their own. And when you're sharing phones, it's not a good place to keep Bitcoin on it because the guy you're sharing the phone with might just take your Bitcoin. And the second thing is, is they're having trouble recharging them. They're not always buying data plans. And that means having to find Wi-Fi. And so there's lots of hurdles to just using Bitcoin where having cash in hand, you know, a physical printed dollar, uh, is much easier for them to deal with. And so while on one side, Bitcoin can help them avoid the hyperinflation, even, even though Bitcoin experiences significant drops in value, ultimately it tends to hold more value than the local currencies. Um, and even though that is true, when you're spending every dime you get in order to put food on the table, you really don't care about trying to preserve the value of your money. You're spending your money just to buy uh, the essentials for life. And so uh, while I used to, and in many of my videos, talked about Bitcoin being able to solve a hair on fire problem for Venezuelans, 
I was severely wrong. I want to apologize for that. And I, I just, just kind of went wow when I saw that and listened to that podcast yesterday. So the third thing that I was going to share here, uh oh, I'll put the link down below. I don't know what you'll be able to do or not do. I was able to read the article and highlight aspects of it, but it looks like the New York Times has some sort of timeout so that if you haven't bought or paid for a subscription, you have to log in in order to continue reading. Um, the bottom line for the article is it was by a, a doctor who's currently working in Spain where some of the worst coronavirus, some of the worst of the pandemic is happening right now. And he was com comparing that to his experiences when he also used to work in Venezuela about four years ago. And just kind of comparing the contrast between uh, Spain today and Venezuela a couple of years ago when he was working there. And unfortunately, uh, things are getting very, very severe in Spain, and uh, it, it could be something that's coming in place for a lot of other countries. So, in conclusion, how can I be of service to you? If you have questions or comments, please leave them below. If you disagree with me, I'd love to reply to your plight disagreements. Um, and, and please consider the things that we're talking about, because... Uh, it, it can make a big difference for yourself and for your family. Um, I, I apologize for being uh, not as upbeat as I normally am, but I hope that the information is useful for you, your families, and the ones that you love. In the meantime, like, subscribe, and hodl, and I hope that you have a fantastic day.